Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Minnesota House of Representatives Transportation and Finance and Policy Committee for this March 31st. Our first item of business is Mr. Dodge will take the role of members to establish a quorum. Mr. Dodge. Present. Present. Vice Chair Cagle. Cagle present. Cagle present. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg present. Representative Barr. Barr here. Present. Um, Mr. Dodge, we're having a little trouble hearing you. I don't know if um, there's a way to adjust your mic or. Elkins, is that better, Mr. Chair? Yes. Mason present. Mason present. Representative Murphy. Representative Murphy. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Nelson present. Representative Olson. Olson present. Olson present. Representative Richardson. Richardson present. Richardson present. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson present. Torkelson present. Representative West. West present. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Dodge, and thank you, Representative Torkelson. <laughs> um, uh, members, so we have uh, a number of bills we want to get through before 2.30, and then we're going to recess and hear uh, uh, several more bills, a couple more bills tonight. So just- Mr. Um, Chair? Open yes. Uh, oh, we Mr. have- Chair, I, I minutes, will, minutes, I will, minutes, minutes. I will move the minutes of Tuesday's mm -hmm. meeting. Representative Petersburg moves the minutes from uh, March 29th. Uh, is there discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Uh, I was very anxious to get into our agenda because we want to move through it as quickly as possible. And our first um, bill today is House File 4571 uh, from Representative Pinto. And uh, the motion here will be uh, to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in an omnibus transportation bill. Uh, Representative Pinto, welcome to the committee and tell us about your bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I think this is my first time ever in the Transportation Committee, and I'm so pleased to be with all of you. Uh, this is for a very good cause. You're very uh, members welcome. welcome here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think members are aware that I serve as a prosecutor and my work outside the legislature. Um, and as such, uh, I have been involved in sending many people to um, to be incarcerated for things um, that they've done in our community. Um, and those people get out um, of uh, incarceration. It, it is in all of our interests that they be absolutely a success and have successful, productive lives as they get out. Um, the bill before you, 4571, recognizes the unique challenges that are faced by those individuals who are striving to reintegrate into our community upon the release from incarceration, struggling with stable housing, employment, um, et cetera. Um, they need to be able to get around. And um, often they find that their um, driver's license was suspended um, due to perhaps a traffic violation, unpaid fines, et cetera, that they incurred before their incarceration. Um, then they serve uh, time in custody. Um, lack of a valid license as they get out um, can make it really difficult for them to find and keep employment um, for the steady income that they need to then be productive members of our societies we all want. Um, so the bill would establish a reintegration driver's license, a temporary driver's license available to them. Um, I think I'm gonna turn to my um, first testifier to give more details about the mechanics of this. I wanna make sure members understand the importance of kind of the big picture. Representative Pinto, uh, before we move to testimony, I know you have a DE1 amendment. Oh. I thought we should uh, do, Thank take you. care of that first. Uh, do you thank want to explain you. the DE1? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. I am moving the DE1 for you, Representative Pinto. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so um, uh, setting this up has been somewhat complicated to sort of make the mechanics and the language work. And so the DE amendment before you members is one um, that's the, the product of a lot of work to make sure that we have a mechanism that can achieve the goal that I described and can achieve it well. And so I'd ask members to, to put this on so we can have the full uh, bill in front of you and the, the, the mechanism that will work. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Pinto. Is there any discussion to the DE1 amendment? Uh, seeing none, we'll do a voice vote on this. Members, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails. And we have House File 4571 as amended before us. And um, uh, I have three testifiers for the bill. Uh, the first is Anna Odegaard, the director of the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. Welcome back to the committee, Ms. Odegaard. And please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Anna Odegaard, and I'm the director of the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. We are, for those of you who don't know, we're a statewide coalition of nonprofit organizations supporting asset building opportunities for low-income individuals and families. We wholeheartedly support this bill. We are grateful to Representative Pinto for taking the lead on the bill, and of course, to Chair Hornstein and the committee for hearing it. I'm going to offer a brief walkthrough of the details of the bill, then turn it over to two testifiers here who are the real momentum behind this initiative. As Representative Pinto noted, people reentering their community after being incarcerated face unique challenges, and the reintegration driver's license is a tool to help with successful reintegration. This license is available to individuals who have spent at least 180 days incarcerated and who have a Minnesota driver's license that is suspended or revoked for unpaid fines or violations committed prior to their incarceration. Applicants must apply within 365 days of release and the license is valid for 365 days from issuance. Certain serious driving violations, even if they occurred prior to incarceration, would exclude an individual for eligibility, as would certain health conditions. Exclusions for this license match the eligibility exclusions in Chapter 171.30 for Minnesota's existing limited license. One key difference between this reintegration license and the limited license in Chapter 171.30 is that the limited license is often limited to where a person can drive. For instance, often it's only from home to work or home to school. Because this reintegration license is intended to benefit individuals who are working on finding stable housing, reestablishing uh, routines for employment, reunifying with their family, and meeting requirements of community supervision, such as probation and parole meetings, counseling appointments, community service requirements, um, because they have so many responsibilities and they're establishing their new routines, the license is not restricted to driving to certain places. However, this license is intended as a one-time chance for people who have served their time and are making a fresh start. So the license would be canceled if the driver commits any new violations that would cause a suspension or revocation of a regular driver's license. At the end of 365 days, if the person has not committed any new violations, they would be eligible for reinstatement of full driving privileges and would need to pay the regular driver's license application fee. Just a clarification, if they still had outstanding unpaid fines, those fines would not disappear. Likely by the end of a year, if they had not been paid off, they would be in collections and the person would still be responsible to pay off those fines. I hope you'll take a look at the written testimony in your packets. You'll see that many organizations working with people released from incarceration support this reintegration license as a critical tool to create access to employment, reduce recidivism and support family stability. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Odegaard. And members, will um, we have two additional testifiers, and if uh, any members have questions of the testifiers, we'll take them at that time after the third testifier has completed testimony. Our next testifier is Eve Runyon, the president and CEO of the Pro Bono Institute. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Eve Runyon and I am the president and CEO of a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. called the Pro Bono Institute. My organization seeks to promote justice for individuals in underserved communities. Primarily, we work with major law firms and companies around the country to encourage lawyers and legal staff to provide pro bono services to those in need. In Minnesota, we serve on the steering committee of the Minnesota Collaborative Justice Project which brings together different organizations to improve reentry outcomes for individuals who are returning to the community in Minnesota from federal and state facilities. The Collaborative Justice Project includes representatives from law firms and companies in Minnesota, legal services organizations, the Department of Corrections, Bureau of Prisons, 
U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services, as well as nonprofit organizations that provide services to individuals returning to the community. We as a project understand the challenges that not having a driver's license presents to individuals trying to reintegrate into the community. It's a barrier faced by many of the individuals that the organizations and the collaborative serve in their individual capacity and that we collectively as a project serve. Not having a driver's license impedes individuals' ability to find and maintain employment, obtain housing, and establish family connections, as well as attending treatment and other requirements necessary for reentry. The Collaborative Justice Project is focused on trying to reduce obstacles to successful reentry so that we reduce recidivism and improve lives. Having a driver's license can be an important first step to successful reentry. And for these reasons, we support House File 4571. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Runyon. Thank you for your work. Uh, we have one more testifier, uh, Jamie Rigling, uh, for Reentry Affairs Coordinator for the U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. My name is Jamie Rigling. Thank you, Chairman Horstein and committee for allowing me to be the voice to speak for justice-involved individuals who continue to experience these driver's license reinstatement barriers. I'm employed by U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services here in the District of Minnesota as the Community Intervention Administrator. I have a licensed clinical social work degree and a licensed alcohol and drug counseling degree. I've been assisting those with releasing from incarceration for their placement, for their completion of their community service hours, employment, housing, identification, and transportation for nearly three years. Prior to this appointment in the judiciary, I have served as the Reentry Affairs Coordinator for the Bureau of Prisons for nine years. During my combined 12 years of assisting justice-involved individuals, I have witnessed hundreds of clients released with these barriers associated to fines and fees that occur prior to incarceration. Many times these old fines or violation result in a suspension or revocation on their driver's license that they can't get lifted without paying hundreds or even thousands of dollars in fines. I have seen many times the alleged offense are in pending status in our state Minces court system for several years, oftentimes for more than a decade. Should someone release from custody with three or more DAR or DAS and pay those fines without going to a hearing officer, the actual conviction can lead to the consequence of losing their privileges for up to a year. It becomes difficult to understand these and to explain to the clients and even more difficult to assist them with attaining and re retaining their employment, especially in greater Minnesota. I've been assisting clients one by one and speaking to other service providers who also assist individuals with the DAR and the DAS cancellations. We are seeing the impact of the growing number from the first step signed in 2018, our early releases due to COVID. There, were new, there was a unanimous realization that a reintegration bill was needed and to elevate this to a level of a systems change. Allowing for this opportunity would not only help our clients, our service providers, it would also help driver's license hearing officers not to be buried in these cases and could, to, could attend to a more current offenses, perhaps even more serious in nature than unpaid tickets. Yesterday, I called to check on one of our clients who I had been working with for nearly two years. In April of 2020, he reached out while he was incarcerated to work on these fees and fines so he could have a valid driver's license when he released. I worked with Hennepin County, an attorney who volunteers her time to assist me to resolve some of these cases, but we were unable to work through them all. He had pending fees in five counties. A few months later, in May of 2021, when he released, he paid his fines. The money he had saved, he used the money he had saved, but he quickly learned that this would not be the best option for reinstatement, as it triggered the DMV that he was convicted of all of these in a certain time frame, leading to an extended, extend, extended suspension period for habitual violations, even though the violations all occurred prior to his incarceration. When he got impatient and paid all of them, we ended up having to uh, file a motion to vacate and have the pleas dismissed. It is nearly two years later. And yesterday when I called him, I found out he is finally eligible for reinstatement next week. 
Like nearly half the clients I serve on federal probation, he's an African-American. He's a 41-year-old and the father of 10 children. He had accumulated more than $3,000 in fines prior to his incarceration. When he released, he had several court-ordered conditions to meet. He had 60 hours of community service, thousands of dollars in child support arrears, a mandate for mental health and chemical health assessments, along with these driving fees that dated back, some of them, to 2007, when all he wanted to do was enjoy his family's reunification. Our reentry court team decided allowing him to volunteer to coach his son's basketball team would be one way he could demonstrate compassion and one way we could demonstrate compassion to his existing transportation issues. He has maintained employment. He's followed all of his conditions. He had paid his debt by his time of incarceration. So this was the least we could do. He and many other justice-involved individuals are the reason I am here before you today, asking for you to consider how this might change the trajectory of someone's transition after incarceration. I know we all want to make our Minnesota roads safer and empower our justice-involved individuals to become law-abiding citizens in our communities. It is my belief that together we can start with demonstrating support by removing this unnecessary transportation barrier for 365 days after their release. In closing, I would like to add that I've been seated with the federal judiciary under, under Chief Judge Thunheim since 2019. Eve, Run Eve Runyon from PBI, who you heard testimony from, she and I routinely join federal reentry court as part of the team to the Honorable Senior Judge Susan Richard Nelson and Honorable Senior Judge Donovan Frank. We have tirelessly watched and assisted participants with resolving their driver's license fees and issues having, that are having to do with offense prior to custody. In addition, Judge Frank, who has been my mentor for over three years, has opened an invitation that if Chairman Hornstein or committee members would like to contact him to discuss the obstacles from his perspective, specifically in greater Minnesota, that you can let me know and I will make those arrangements. Thank you, Chairman Hornstein and committee for your time today, and I'm honored to have had this opportunity. Thank you very much for your testimony, uh, Ms. Rigling. And now members, we uh, will discuss the bill and uh, if anyone has questions for the author or the testifiers, now is the time, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a couple questions for you before we, we get to this, uh, to the bill itself. Uh, I know that you and I had chatted about whether First of all, could you remind us uh, where this is going or if it's staying here? Because it's, it seems laid, like it's, it's laid over, and I know that you had some questions about uh, judiciary and fines and fees, and I did talk with uh, uh, Representative Pinto about that and, and others. And so uh, did you want to put that question to him, or did I well, summarize that? Not, not only that, but also the issue of whether or not it fit within our deadline uh, procedures as well. Right. Um, Representative Pinto. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, Representative Petersburg. I guess um, uh, the when you said our our deadlines, if you're talking about the House deadlines, then it should not be an issue as long as it's simply being laid over. Um, the the bill, the issue would be that if this committee were going to send it elsewhere, then it could perhaps be an issue there. But seeing as how this is squarely about driver's licenses, which is within this committee's jurisdiction, I, I, I wouldn't think there'd be any need to send it elsewhere. And then and the deadlines don't apply. It'll just be up to the committee as to whether you want to include it in your, in your uh, budget bill. Representative Petersburg, thank you. Uh, thank you. Th Pinto. Thank you. I'll, I'll let it go at that for now. But let me ask a question of somebody, whether it's the author or testifiers or maybe some of the department. I know that it, it looks like, or at least there's implied that there may be some driver's license reintegrations uh, for driver's license suspensions that are not covered under this. What would those be uh, if somebody has kind of a general idea of what they might be? Um. Chair Pinto or a testifier? Uh, well, how about Ms. Odegaard will take that one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Pinto, is that okay if I answer that? Um, and Representative Petersburg, thanks for the question. We've had a couple of conversations with folks over at DPS, making sure we're sorting out exactly what is and isn't eligible. The language in the bill um, matches exactly the eligibility, as I mentioned, in the 171.30, the limited license provisions. But to just give you some examples, for instance, there are some more serious DUI convictions that might have um, 
as part of a sentence might have, say, a 365 day revocation. If that revocation is still uh, the revocation of as part of their sentence is still active, they would not be eligible for this reinstatement, this reintegration license until that period was over. On the other hand, there are some people who have um, had their revocation period for their DUI that has been served but they're waiting on the, the $680 reinstatement fee, that that's the only thing holding them back, um, they would be eligible for this. So it's really some of those more serious driving violations um, that are not included in the limited license program that would also be excluded from this license. Representative Petersburg, one follow up, and then we'll have uh, Representative Torkelson, Representative Barr, and then we'll move on. Uh, Mr. Peters Chair, I'm, I'm good at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Torkelson, then uh, Representative Barr. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of quick questions, and I'm not sure who's best to answer them. First, uh, you know, when someone's incarcerated, they they, incar they are incarcerated. Having a valid driver's license, can they keep that uh, throughout their incarceration, is or is that dependent on how long they're in in prison? Uh, who would like to take that one? Um, Ms. Odegaard, if she's Ms. able to. Ms. Odegaard, if she can. Ms. Odegaard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Torkelson. Yeah, th there's no particular reason that the license would be suspended or revoked while, in, in, while incarcerated unless there were violations like Jamie was talking about that might be processed while they're incarcerated that would lead to a suspension or revocation. It's also possible that that license would simply have expired by the time um, they're released. Um, however, if, if there are no revocation or suspension holds and the license is simply expired, it's not very expensive. I think it's, I did this recently, maybe $40 to get that reinstated. Those are not the folks who would likely be interested in this reintegration license. Um, it, it would be if there's a suspension or revocation that was the result of unpaid fines or, or violations prior to being incarcerated. Does that answer your question? Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, yes, that's fine. Then the other question of, is uh, how common is this need? How many uh, uh, people released from prison, both federally and statewide, uh, and from state prisons are, are in need of this service? Ms. Odegaard. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Torkelson. Um, so we did some, some back of the envelope calculations. I will just be upfront and say those, those actual statistics are, are not available, but we do know, for instance, how many people are released on an annual basis from federal and state correctional facilities. Um, and just to give you those numbers, there are about 5,000 um, people re released from state correctional facilities last year. And I'm turning, I'm looking at Jamie's window. It's just a few hundred, I believe, released from federal institutions back into Minnesota. Jamie, can I double check? Can you not? Yeah. Jamie herself, because she works with these individuals, has done a little bit of research on her own caseload. And she estimates that about 40% of the people that she works with who are being released from federal incarceration back into Minnesota have some kind of a hold, a suspension or revocation on their driver's license. If that is a similar number, and, and about 10% of those are either health-related or age-related um, that wouldn't be eligible for this. Um, so if we estimate about 30%, if that is if that holds for the folks coming out of state incarceration, it would look like something like 1,100 or 1,200 people per year would be eligible to apply for this reintegration license. Thank you for your questions, Representative Torkelson. Let's move on to Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe Anna uh, Oldegard could probably answer the question best. Okay, uh, get ready, Ms. Odegaard. <laughs> uh, well, I'm looking at section two, uh, line 211 on the DE, or that section subdivision three, which is the child support piece. And I'm kind of curious, this is something that's never really made sense to me. We're going to suspend your driver's license so you can't go to work to earn money to pay your child support that you're behind on. And could you just clarify that? Is that the way I, this is written, that if you're behind in arrears on your child support, you would not be eligible for this license, the, the, the temporary 365-day license? Am I reading that correctly? Ms. Odegaard. Here. Thank you. And Representative Barr, I think you and I have talked about this before. I, I agree with you that we have a problem with making it difficult for people in the arrears with their child support to get to work. Um, however, there are federal regulations around using that 
um, using a driver's license suspension as a penalty for non-payment of child support. We knew this would get much more complicated if we needed to go into that area and try to change regulations. So um, unfortunately, if somebody is suspended for a child support related issue specifically, then they, this license would be canceled. Representative Barr, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, quick one. Um, so if you went to jail for six months, 180 days, and you got out, you would probably, if you were court ordered to pay child support, you would probably be in arrears at that point. Um, can you just walk through that piece real quick? I mean, if, like I said, if you're only in for jail for 180 days, you'd be six months behind, would that suspend your driver's license? Or is there some kind of a, a grace period to try and get caught up in there? Or is, would this piece apply then as well? Mr. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, yes. Ms. Odegaard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Barr. As soon as you set up a payment plan for your child support, you would be eligible for this reintegration license. However, if during that 365 days that this license is valid, if there is another um, suspension of your license due to a problem with your child support, then this license would be canceled. Thank you. I'm good, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you for the questions and thank you for your uh, testimony, Ms. Odegaard. Um, members, we're going to allow our author, Chair Pinto, for a couple of um, closing comments and then we will move on our agenda. Uh, Chair Pinto. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and a big thanks to the three testifiers. They've been working on this really hard. You can tell working on this and then in connection with the broader work that they're doing to make people coming out of custody be successful in society. That is a big benefit for all of us. And um, the way that our, um, our world is structured is that you very often need a car to get around, to be able to work, to have money, to be able to take care of yourself, your family, housing, et cetera. I um, really would urge um, uh, the committee's consideration of this terrific proposal to allow people to do that. And thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for, um, for your help and support. And thank you, Chair Pinto, for your hard work. I also want to echo my thanks to the testifiers and remind the committee there are 10, I think about 10 letters in your packets, all excellent. And uh, please take a look at those uh, as soon as you can. So with that, members, um, I will be uh, laying over House File 4571 as amended. And uh, we're going on to our next bill, which is uh, House File 2904, Representative Lippert. And um, I will also move that this bill be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus transportation bill. And um, Welcome to the committee, Representative Lippert, and uh, uh, you also have an uh, A5 amendment, so why don't we uh, dispense with that first? You can let us know what it is, and um, we will. I will move that, and we'll incorporate it into your bill. Representative Lippert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the amendment uh, changes the requirement for native trees in the bill to climate adapted species. Uh, since some trees that are now native to Minnesota won't be a good fit for our state's changing climate in future decades, and this language also expands uh, the uh, number of trees or species of trees that will be available for planting to. Thank you, members. And I failed to uh, let you know that this is a, a bill for accelerated conservation planting, living snow fences, and tree planting funding. So is there a discussion to the amendment? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails. And now we have... Uh, House File 2904 is amended before us, and Representative Lippert, tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, the goal of this bill as a whole is to plant a tree for every Minnesotan in each of the next four years. 5.7 million additional trees planted per year for the next four years, and uses one-time funding for that. Planting trees is one of the simplest things we can do to naturally sequester carbon and mitigate climate change. The Nature Conservancy estimates that this bill could naturally sequester more than 1 million tons of CO2, the equivalent, equivalent of taking 300,000 vehicles off the road. In addition, planting trees is a simple thing we can do to improve the health of our environment, preventing soil erosion, improving water quality, air quality, providing habitat, and planting trees strategically can also improve safety on our roads in the winter and reduce costs for counties and townships. The bill provides funding for four areas, that will allow the trees planted to provide multiple benefits. The bill supports planting on school grounds, accelerates conservation plantings, supports communities as they replace trees lost to emerald ash borer. And then the focus of this hearing provides an additional $4 million to MnDOT's Living Snow Fence Program. 
With me today is Will Bullmeyer, a county official, and he can testify and say more about the Living Snow Fence Program. Thank you very much, Representative Lippert, and we'll uh, hear from uh, Mr. Bowmeyer and then take any questions from members. Uh, Mr. Bowmeyer, welcome to the uh, committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the board. My name is Will Bowmeyer. I am Assistant Maintenance Superintendent, uh, Permits and Right-of-Way for Carleton County Transportation Department. Um, I'm here to express support for the House Bill under consideration 2904, um, specifically living windbreaks as they relate to uh, road and road maintenance. Uh, they improve safety, providing better visibility for the traveling public and a more predictable driving surface. You don't have those areas where snow is blowing across the road and then dry pavement and snow blowing across the road. Uh, they reduce maintenance, um, specifically with overtime. Uh, road departments uh, such as MnDOT, counties and municipalities will have fewer call-outs during overtime to go chase snowdrifts and snowdrifts alone. Uh, it reduces the amount of material such as salt, uh, which is a hot button issue right now for water quality that we have to put down on the road. And it reduces our fuel costs, which is a big, big topic issue uh, right now at a time of high fuel prices. Now uh, they provide wildlife habitat uh, for both migra migrating birds and pollinators. Uh, they store carbon and they reduce the amount of carbon burned and the amount of fuel savings and diesel fuel burn. Uh, and they provide water quality, surface water and groundwater quality benefits with reduced calcium chloride applications um, and uh, sand and provide soil health benefits in terms of reduced soil erosion, which is also a visibility factor we don't often think about uh, we always think about winter and blowing snow, um, but if you've uh, a specific stretch of road that I drive often uh, around North Branch, sometimes on I-35, soil erosion can cause visibility issues as well. Um, some may ask why a county department, why, why would we be in support of a bill that would support MnDOT? Um, well, this when MnDOT um, is successful in their living snow fence and windbreak and tree planting, uh, initiatives uh, that helps us locally because uh, members of the public and local landowners uh, see those examples and we can point to those examples to help us sell this practice to local landowners along our county road system. So with that, I thank the chair and uh, members of the members for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much for your testimony. That concludes our testimony. Um, questions from members to the author or the testifier, Represent Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and this would be to the author. And during your presentation of the amendment, you talked about um, native Minnesota trees that would uh, no longer be, I think your implication was no longer valid into the future. Can you give us some examples of some of those trees that are now native to Minnesota that you don't think should be planted? Representative Lippert. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and Representative Peterson, Petersburg, excuse me. Um, I think in general, we're, we're, we know that hardiness zones are moving north. Uh, there's a general estimate that over the next 100, 150 years, uh, most if not all the boreal forest will, will move north out of Minnesota. So we know these hardiness zones are moving, moving north and then it will be the determination of local officials to sort out uh, you know, which trees are gonna be best suited considering this, this moving, these moving hardiness zones uh, for particular areas in the state, whether that's Southern Minnesota, Central Minnesota, or Northern Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Liberal. To follow up, Representative Petersburg. Uh, just, just a comment, and I'll make it brief. Uh, we're making the assumptions on what will, what will happen. And if it doesn't happen and we plant the trees that are for warmer climates, that could be an issue too. So uh, just keeping it in mind. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that observation, Representative Petersburg. I do not see any further member questions. So at this point, I'll ask Representative Lippert uh, to provide us with any closing thoughts. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. I know you're balancing uh, many priorities, but I uh, hope you will uh, consider this proposal. As we heard in testimony, it's uh, planting trees in this way and the Living Snow Fence Program really provides multiple benefits. And so I think uh, these dollars are going to be put to great use. So thank you for the time and consideration today. Thank you, Representative Lippert. And uh, members, I am now going to renew my motion that 
House file 2904 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion and omnibus transportation bill. Thank you, Representative Lippert. Our next bill on the agenda is House File 523 from Representative Elkins. Uh, and Representative Elkins, um, I will move that your bill also be laid over for possible inclusion. I know you have uh, quite a bit of testimony here. We'd like to keep this to about a half hour if possible. And um, thank you very much for your bill. And uh, please tell us about House File 523. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe you have an amendment also. Why don't we start? I do. That? Why don't we do, do that first? So the uh, uh, A, A1 amendment uh, to the bill uh, does a couple of things. Uh, it changes the effective year from uh, 2022 to 2023, 20, uh, a year later. Uh, it phases in the proposed uh, mileage base in, impact fees. Uh, and um, uh, it phases out or eliminates a, uh, a, um, uh, an enrollment fee that was in, in the original bill, and we're taking that out because we think it's an, a disincentive to the adoption of uh, electric vehicles. So we're actually on a little earlier um, than expected, so I'll probably rearrange the order of some of the, uh, the, the testifiers. Um, yeah. But uh, let me um, share my screen, and here we go. This is the one I want. Okay. So I'll illustrate the, the concept here uh, with a, a simple uh, example of a, uh, a Ford F-150 uh, uh, pickup truck. And, and, and you know, the, the, uh, what we're trying to answer here, I should go back one actually, um, uh, you know, answer the question, um, you know, right now we get, you know, the gas tax generates about um, $917 million to the highway user tax distribution fund. And the question we're trying to answer here is, how do we replace this revenue in a fair way as electric vehicles displace gasoline powered vehicles and gas tax windows away as a revenue source? So we're proposing that uh, uh, we do that by uh, assessing a mileage charge uh, in lieu of the gas tax on electric vehicles and I'll illustrate it with this one simple example. So let's take two versions of the same vehicle. Uh, the Ford, um, standard Ford F-150 uh, uh, truck uh, the most popular vehicle in, uh, in North America and a basic version with a 3.5 liter V6 engine that gets approximately the, the average mileage for um, uh, pickup trucks as a whole, which is at 19.4 miles per gallon. So at 19.4 miles per gallon, if the car is driven an average number of miles, which is about 11,500 and pays a gas tax of 28.5 cents a gallon, they would pay a total of $169 in gas taxes over the course of the year. So the Ford F-150 Lightning, which is now in production, um, in order to uh, you know, raise the same $169 um, from that vehicle um, using a mileage-based tax, the equivalent uh, um, um, rate per mile would be 1.47 cents per mile. So if that vehicle is driven, also driven 11,500 uh, miles, uh, under my proposal, uh, once the rates are fully phased in, uh, uh, that, that, in uh, that vehicle would pay 1.47 cents per mile and would also over the, pay over the course of, of the year um, $169 in, in mileage fees. So, to my mind, this, this seems fair. Um, there, you know, there will be some who will argue that uh, the electric vehicle is heavier, therefore it should pay more. Uh, there are others who will argue, uh, and will argue today, uh, that because the uh, Ford F-150 Lightning gets uh, the equivalent of 68 miles per gallon rather than the 19.4, 20 miles per gallon that the gas-powered version of the car uh, does, it should pay quite a bit less. And I think that's a, a worthwhile to discussion for uh, us to have. So that kind of sets the context. So um, more broadly, the, the, uh, the rate that would be paid would depend on what type of a vehicle and would divide the vehicles in according to its uh, existing EPA vehicle types, which are <coughs> sedans and wagons, which once the fee was fully paid in, uh, phased in would pay uh, you know, 89, uh, you know, 0.899 cents for less, less than a penny a mile. And as the vehicle type be, uh, becomes uh, you know, heavier, less fuel efficient, uh, the rate would be uh, higher uh, based on the average mileage 
uh, you know, that, that, that vehicles in those classes pay up to almost a penny and a half for, for the pickup trucks as in the, in the previous example. The rates would be phased in over, over three years. So the, the first year we implemented that, it would be uh, only half these rates. The second year, 75, and you wouldn't get to the full rate to the, uh, until the third year. Uh, and we can discuss the phasing in as, as well. And the program would be volunteered. It would be a, a flat fee alternative if the provider didn't want to, uh, to uh, participate in the program. Uh, but in almost all cases, uh, people paying the, the, the flat fee uh, would end up paying more than people participating in the program. And I want to tip my hat to uh, Matt Burris, our, our outstanding house research analyst who uh, really came up with this particular way of doing it because it's very administratively easy to do uh, and it would be tied to the gas tax. If we raise the gas tax, this would go up as well. And it's tied also to average vehicle miles per gallon. So if, you know, vehicle mile um, MPG keeps improving, this, these would go down as well. Um, but the key point is, you know, by, um, you know, doing it in this way, uh, as we, you know, the, the fleet migrated from, you know, from being internal combustion engine driven cars to electric cars, the revenues in the, going into the highway um, uh, user tax distribution fund would stay level. You would see an exact offset of uh, during the transition, uh, you know, every time a, uh, um, an electric vehicle displaced uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle of the same type, the same amount of revenue would be, uh, would be, uh, would be collected. So, uh, you know, that's, we can use that as the starting point for this session. The bill is going to be laid over so we can continue this, this discussion. But, you know, this is what I think most people would, would say is a fair way to go about, about doing this. So we're um, next next presentation. Representative Elkins, if you could uh, start wrapping up yep, soon, I know the number of testifiers, so we, yeah, we yep. do need to move along. Yeah, so I will move on to the Emovis testifiers now. But the, the last question that will be, get asked will be, well, if this is such a good idea, why don't we just charge, charge mileage fees to, to both classes of vehicles? Uh, and the answer is that uh, the gas tax is actually a very efficient tax. The collection costs are 0.2% because we only collect it from a dozen wholesalers around the the state. So if we put all of the vehicles on, on the mileage base fee where they where MnDOT will testify that we expect in the long term that the cost will be five to 13 percent of collection, it dramatically reduces the amount of net revenue that would go into the highway user uh, tax distribution fund. So last slide before we get in here, uh, I know that the big bugaboo, the thing everybody worries about is Will uh, Big Brother be tracking my my uh, uh, my travels? The answer to that is no. I'll just offer this example. This is data that I downloaded from my own car, and this is all you need. All we're going to collect is odometer readings. All we need is how many miles the car is being driven. The information is on the car to be downloaded, and our next testifiers, um, uh, Charlie Mitchell and Ben Miners from Emovis, will now explain how that works. Thank you, Representative Elkins. Now you still have your A1 amendment out there. Do you want us to? Uh, oh, I haven't moved it yet. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah let's move, move that amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay, is there discussion to the A1? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails on a two to nothing vote. Uh, members, um, uh, how would you like to handle this? Uh, we want to have Mr. Uh, Mitchell. Mr. And, Mitchell. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mitchell, uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Charlie, you're on, you're on mute. Let's see. We see the slides, but we don't have audio, Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, okay. All right, how about now? There we go. Better. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Charlie Mitchell. I'm the director of ITS programs at Imovis Technologies US, uh, a supplier of road user charging solutions. I'll proceed and... Uh, Again, we're under a, a time constraint, so um, if you can move through your slides relatively quickly, uh, we'd appreciate that. Sure. 
uh, the quickest way to understand the solution is to look at it uh, through the, the customer journey. So we've got complete control over, you know, by on a state by state basis, which vehicles you'd like to enroll in the program. Enrollment for a customer is a matter of going to a website, providing information about their vehicle and their method of payment. Uh, we then select a mileage reporting option, either an OBD2 plug-in aftermarket device or uh, direct uh, telematics or, or, or app uh, method of collecting mileage information. As part of that enrollment process, we make our terms and conditions around data privacy and security very clear, and the customer has to accept those in order to enroll. Once they receive their device, they plug it into the OBD2 port in their car and take a, a, a mandatory odometer photo with an app that we provide. Uh, if their vehicle is a telematics vehicle, it doesn't require the plug-in device. Uh, instead, what we do is get them to grant uh, permission for us to collect uh, odometer information. Uh, the, the, uh, the customer is always in charge of what they're granting permission to. From that point forward, they simply drive and their account would be replenished as needed when their account balance gets low using the credit card that they've already put on file. They would receive a periodic statement every month telling them about their charges and how close they are to reaching their cap. Once a year, we require that they take a true up odometer photo using the same application. This allows us a way to audit the system, make adjustments. Uh, the technology that we use to do this is established. It's, it's in place right now. Um, for example, we've already done uh, integration in the state of Utah to a Fast Enterprises DMV system. Um, the device itself that we supply is not an ordinary uh, low-cost OBD2 scanner. Uh, it, the uh, similarity it shares, of course, it has an OBD2 bus interface, but beyond that, it is a data logger and it has a GPS antenna and receiver to, uh, to know where the location of the vehicle is. And it has a wireless cellular data connection using a, you know, a radio and a SIM card. For the telematics connection, we use a data broker, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that provides connectivity through the OEMs of, of the vehicles uh, to us, uh, very limited amount of information. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, for each of these programs, we create a state branded and customized website that the customer can use to not only enroll, but to manage their account, change their method of payment, change the addresses, add and remove vehicles, things like this. Uh, ben, can I get you to jump in here and talk uh, quickly about data ownership? Of course. Hi, I'm Ben Miners from IMS, uh, enabling the technology behind some of the programs that Charlie has described. Uh, I want to make it very clear that data ownership always rests with the vehicle owner. Uh, in none of these programs is the ownership of data being transferred uh, to a technology provider or to any other entity. Uh, rights are requested to help process and handle that data on behalf of the appropriate agency, but there are, is at no point a transfer of ownership of data. And so just to make sure that's very clear to everyone. There are some optional services typically available in programs um, that can be used if location information is optionally shared. I'm make sure very clear that this is optional and not required to enable a road use charge or a mod space usage fee program. Thank you, Ben. The, um, the reason that we, in some cases, want to acquire and use location data is if we want to make an exclusion for miles driven out, out of state. So our principles, um, I'm not going to go through all of these slides here, but our, our principles around security and privacy uh, you know, are, are not centered on just building a secure system, but rather on first collecting as little data as is necessary. Um, and then second, not propagating it any farther in the system than it needs to go. So, you know, when a DOT or a DMV is our client, in most cases, much of the information that we 
need in order to process charges does not need to be propagated further. And so at no point in time would the DOT's IT systems become a hacking target because it contained location information. But I think one of the most significant things to bear in mind about the location data is it is not real time. So we don't need, in order to, to make these charges, we don't need to know where a vehicle is uh, immediately. We are very happy to get data that uh, comes to us at the end of the day, at the end of a trip. And I think- Mr. Mitchell, uh, uh, we do, Mr. Mitchell we, we really need you to wrap up. We have many uh, other testifiers. Perfect, that was my ending. I was just gonna say, Representative Elkins, I'll take your direction from here. Okay. Thank you. Representative Elkins, you have, I think you have a preferred order. So um, members, we're gonna take uh, the testimony and then do our usual Q&A after that. So. Uh, Representative Elkins, who do you have next on deck? Uh, we were just getting the link to um, the uh, folks from Utah. I don't think that they've got it yet. So why don't we move on to uh, um, Ken Buckeye from MnDOT. Mr. Buckeye, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, my, members of the committee. My name is Ken Buckeye. I'm a road pricing program manager for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And thank you for the opportunity to provide input on this bill today as amended. Um, the Minnesota Department of Transportation has been examining road user charges for nearly two decades in response to what is predicted to be a significant decline in motor fuel tax revenue in coming years. Deployment of road user charge applications has been a major challenge for all states studying and implementing such policies. House File 2523 represents a positive and appropriate step toward deployment of road user charges and is largely aligned with the research and the demonstrations conducted by MnDOT on this issue, as well as other uh, deployments around the U.S. It is measured, it's incremental, and fundamentally fair to all users and aligns with the user pays principle um, embedded in the motor fuel tax. MnDOT recently completed a demonstration showing the feasibility of using embedded telematics, that is telematics installed by the man manufacturers at the factory. Um, it's also sometimes called uh, native telematics. An aspiration of this research was to understand road user charge collection costs more completely when deployed at scale. Because no road user charge project in the US has yet been tested on a large scale, it is not possible to know the full cost of deployment with a great degree of certainty. However, based on economies of scale and the best estimates from ongoing projects around the country, under full deployment, costs could be in the range of five to 8% of the fees collected, or perhaps less. But we support the notion of using add-on technology to provide the data for fee collection and the use of third-party account managers. We believe the maturation of this idea comes with native telematics. House File 523, as written, allows the state to move forward appropriately with the technology that is now available. Concerns regarding the administrative fees paid to third-party account managers has been addressed with the amendment that sets aside 11% of the vehicle service operating account to be used for um, account providers and administrative costs. While this amount is still significant, it is within reason based on the experience of other states. The phased approach uh, proposed in 523 um, provides a meaningful support to Minnesota's, Minnesotans switching to electric vehicles and allows the state to advance two goals simultaneously, incentivizing zero emission vehicles in Minnesota through a tax reduction and taking an incremental step toward a long-term transportation revenue strategy for Minnesota's multimodal transportation system. It seems quite certain that more and more vehicles of the future will be electric and the state must be prepared with appropriate policy to face this inevitability. House file 523 represents a rational approach to road user charging implementation, one that may one day enable broader deployment. The bill replaces the existing EV registration surcharge, and it also seeks to levy a fair use fee on vehicle owners by creating different rates, as opposed to a single rate for different classes of vehicles compared to the gas powered equivalents. Advancing the notion of 
variable per mile rates on EVs, as this bill does, is a significant improvement over flat road user charge rates, which most states are using in their deployments. Flat road user charges raise, raise equity concerns in that they create winners and losers. Given the auto industry's aggressive move toward EV development and marketing and the federal support for EV adoption, this bill is very timely and appropriate. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Buckeye. And um, Representative Elkins, who's next? Uh, we, I, have, we, I have your testifiers, but I just don't know the order and who's yeah, right. Well, we, we're relying on you. We are a little earlier than we expected actually, which is a nice problem to have, but why don't we move to Ms. Uh, to Director Zhang from DVS and then we'll let uh, Nathan Lee from the uh, state of Utah um, uh, close it up. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Zhang, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Pong Zhang, Director of the Driving Vehicle Services Division. Thank you, Representative Elkins. Uh, so uh, DBS wants to uh, inform the committee that uh, this uh, bill can be administered by DBS. We have completed our fiscal, our portion of the fiscal note. Uh, my understanding is that it's, it's being routed around um, for other agencies to, to contribute before, it, um, before it's available. Um, but we estimated the cost to be about $330,000. Um, there is some, some programming that will need to take place. Uh, we have been working with FAST and we've been in conversation with our colleagues in Utah uh, to talk about how that, this interface could look like in MinDrive. Um, the short answer is it is doable. It, it, will, it will take a, 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 a certain, a, about 20 weeks of programming um, to administer, but I want to share that again, that this, this bill is administrable and we are happy to support um, or continue the conversation and, and, and implement when ready. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Zhang. Um, and who's up next, Representative Elkins? Uh, Mr. Lee. Okay, this is Nathan Lee from the Utah Department of Transportation. Welcome to Minnesota virtually, Mr. Lee. And uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, appreciate being here committee. I'm Nathan Lee with the Utah Department of Ta Transportation. I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation on the Senior Leadership Team for the DOT. I uh, just uh, was asked to give a little bit of information in terms of reading the bill, the Bill 523 and looking at the information. It has a very similar feel to that in Utah, but uh, as every state has differing needs, this one varies slightly in that way, which would probably benefit Minnesota. Um, seems like a great opportunity. Why did Utah, though, to choose to go down this path? In 2003, Utah had a legislative transportation task force that started discussing things around mileage-based funding and what was maybe needed for the future. They were seeing those declines in revenues that were coming from a number of different ways and looking at that. But in 2015, it got real for Utah because we had to pass a gas tax increase. And at the time that we had to pass the gas tax increase, there were a few uh, members of <clears throat> both the House of Representatives and a few of our senators that said, this is the time to look to the future and to decide how to address the future. So they adopted a bill at the time it was House Bill 362, which was a mileage based revenue study. In 2017, they then had that task force that had existed for a number of years uh, apply that study that was done to create what they called Senate Bill 174, which was the launch of a pilot for us into this space to see if there was an alternative method to get sustainable revenue for the changing fleet that was existing in motor vehicles. In 2018, they then passed Senate Bill 136, which created the RUC program and the parameters and said that it would become efficient and effective starting in the year 2020. The year of 2019 then passed additional bills of uh, uh, Senate Bill 72, addressing some of the elements that would need to exist in actually making the program run. Then in 2020, when the bill was launched, uh, we uh, provided a study that showed how the state could have all uh, alternative fuel vehicles in such a program uh, in short order, as well as all the light duty vehicles in the state, about 3 million vehicles currently registered by the year 2031. 
and then this past year, just mm -hmm. ending this 21, 22 session uh, that just occurred, there were yet additional bills that were there. Representative Christopherson, Senator Harper uh, led the charge in those first ones that are there and Representative Ward has joined in the uh, program efforts as well in this last bill to identify changes in the program. But the program has looked at ways to be sustainable. Uh, the reason that we've seen adjustments that we mentioned in some of those programs are towards increasing enrollment protections uh, related to privacy, uh, elements for people to be able to actually uh, get a sustainable revenue coming in from the fleet and to make it equitable for all users. We had a slogan when we launched, it was called drive less, pay less. I'm not sure if Amovis announced this when they were there, but the enrollment at launch was about three times what was expected. And uh, we have about 5,000 vehicles that have enrolled to date. Uh, some have joined and left as vehicles are bought and sold, uh, but we're currently operating a little over 4,000 in the program today here in Utah. And it's on a steady rise. About 20% of electric vehicles are joining the program voluntarily and uh, continue to join as they see value in doing so. Um, Representative Christofferson has been able to join us and um, we'd like to just provide the opportunity for uh, Representative Elkins for him to maybe give a few closing comments in terms of that legislation if you'd like. That would be great, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Lee and Representative Christofferson of Warm Minnesota, welcome to you. We have a fellow uh, House Transportation Chair on the call. We had the Transportation Chair of Georgia a couple of years ago. So now we're, we've got two additional, uh, we got an additional state now. Uh, so please state your name for the record. Proceed with your testimony. We're very honored to have you, Representative uh, Christofferson. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, I'm uh, Representative Kay Christofferson from Utah. Uh, uh, appreciate Nathan uh, going over the majority of uh, what our program is, but as we as we looked at uh, using a road user uh, charge program, we just we we looked at ways to say how can we capture revenue for use of the roads by those who don't use uh, uh, fuel like uh, gasoline or diesel. And what we're doing is trying to say, uh, you know, how can we get these electric users to participate in construction and maintenance of the roadways? And so that's that's mainly what we wanted to do is look at the RUC program and uh, it's user based. It's it, it's a way that it's fair uh, to those who use it. I, we look at uh, possibly doing that with gasoline and diesel users and right now it's so easy to collect it based uh, at the pump that we may put that off for a while but we do want to capture those who don't use gasoline and diesel and and we do have a couple of uh methods of collecting that we can either do it by uh tracking their mileage or we can, uh, what we have done is that if you just want to take an average of the type of vehicle you, you use, uh, take, uh, take an average for um, uh, the average mile, the average mile leads driven and uh, use that for um, an estimate for the year, you can use that. So in other words, you can estimate an amount and we'll charge you that amount or or you or you can do it based on actual mileage so nathan i'm not sure if i <laughs> said that exactly right but uh, well uh, thank you thank you uh, chair uh, chris Everson. i think what i'd like to do if it's okay with you uh, representative elkins is you know we have um three more testifiers but i want to make sure that uh, i don't want our guests from utah to uh, have to uh, sit through the entire hearing. So maybe members, if anyone has any questions of uh, Chair Christofferson or Mr. Lee at this point, you can ask those. And if not, we can uh, proceed to three more testifiers that I have on the list. Um, uh, Representative Petersburg, uh, 
Question to either of our guests from Utah. Uh, thank you, I, and just briefly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to uh, Representative Christopherson. Uh, so I, generally in dealing with the um, uh, gasoline tax, that's done at the wholesale level, and in which then it seems like people going through your state and you going out of state, it, it kind of captures everything uniformly. Uh, was there any thought about trying to capture uh, electricity fees at, wholes at the wholesale uh, point of charging rather than going this direction? Chair Christofferson. Thank you. Uh, we've thought about that a little bit. Nathan, you could probably give us some uh, more details on why or why not uh, we haven't really looked at that, but I think it, a lot of it has to do with just the ability to um, collect that. And Nathan, what do you think? Mr. Lee. Uh, yes, Representative Petersburg, when we look at that, there's a couple of options. One is just charging a regular fee like you would do in income tax. Uh, another choice is to look at those source options that you're talking about. When you move in those source options, there's elements that start to move on you. There's those that need to charge while they're in transit. So from different charging stations, and you can look at how you collect that similar to you would a gas fuel station. But then there's also the majority of charging happens at either businesses or private residences. And again, separating out what those charges look like is a little complicated as well. The model right now in a lot of electricity uh, with rapid charging has a different charge structure that's quite pricey if you try to pay for rapid charging today, because they look at that high pressure demand in a short duration uh, a little differently than the way cars use it today. So there's a bunch of elements that we've been working with like Rocky Mountain Power, those that are in that space for us today to figure out how we would move or even shift into that electrical charge side. Um, the, and then of course, picking the road usage charge uh, method is another way to collect those fees. Or as Representative Christofferson said, you could establish essentially an unlimited mile or a flat fee rate for those who choose not to participate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions for our guests from Utah? Well, I wanted to thank both of you very much for your informative testimony and uh, working with us here and particularly with uh, Representative Elkins. Really great to see you. And obviously, you're welcome to stick around on Zoom. Uh, but I did. I'm very conscious of both of your time and uh, appreciate very much your joining us today. Thank so you. Very much. We, th thank you, Chair. Um, we have um, three more testifiers. We'll do our best and we'll get all of our member questions, et cetera, in this afternoon uh, and uh, do our best to wrap up this bill and do in good time here. Uh, but we do have additional testimony. Three more uh, members of the public have signed up. Uh, first is Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Graves, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, I want to I want to just take a moment here today uh, to, to thank Representative Elkins for his thoughtful approach to ensuring that as the uh, the size of the EV fleet grows in Minnesota, that we have some means to ensure that uh, we have the resources necessary to fund the continued maintenance and build out of our of our transportation infrastructure. Um, we uh, we have long advocated uh, for some means of ensuring uh, uh, EVs pay a commensurate amount into the, uh, the maintenance and upkeep of our system, uh, just like gas tax uh, payers do. And, uh, and we've been happy to have many conversations with Representative Elkins over the last couple of years uh, about how to do that by way of this, this road user charge. Um, the whether it's that, whether it's uh, you know, continuing on the, in increasing the, the fee that's in place now or, or other means, um, our view is just that it's important that we get these pieces in place now. While the size of the fleet is relatively small, um, to ensure that we have these pieces in place as the size as the fleet grows and as uh, the industry moves in this direction. So from our perspective, you know, our members rely on a safe, efficient uh, transportation system to get their goods to market and their employees and their customers to their door. 
and uh, and we've just been pleased to be part of this this conversation in this in this thinking about how to make these moves now uh, to prepare us for the future. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Elkins. Happy to stand for any questions uh, you or others may have. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Um, our next testifier is Brendan Jordan from Drive Electric, Minnesota. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Proceed for the test. Proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Brendan Jordan, uh, Vice President of Transportation and Fuels at the Great Plains Institute. I serve as a facilitator for Drive Electric Minnesota. Uh, Drive Electric Minnesota advocates for uh, policy to jumpstart Minnesota's small but growing electric vehicle sector. Uh, our membership includes automakers, uh, nonprofit environmental and climate organizations, electric utilities, rural electric cooperatives, and automotive dealers, among others. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Representative Elkins for his work in this area. Uh, Representative Elkins, you've, you've gone out of your way to reach out to Drive Electric Minnesota and our members and uh, discuss this proposal and, and address our concerns. And I want to thank you for being a friend of the electric vehicle community in Minnesota. Um, I do appreciate the, some, some of the changes in the amendment, including the phase in and uh, waiving the administrative fees, which does seem appropriate for a, a pilot program. Um, we do have some uh, concerns with the program, however, uh, and uh, just I'll quickly share a few, a few issues for the consideration of the committee. First of all, I, I do wanna share a, a study uh, from the Alliance for Transportation Electrification conducted with Atlas Public Policy that is in the member packets. There is a, a bit of a misconception here that electric vehicles are a con significant contributor to declining gasoline tax revenue. As the study shows, it's not the case today and it's not expected to be the case even out to 2030. The biggest contributor to declining gas tax revenue is the increasing fuel efficiency of non-EVs, of gasoline-powered vehicles. Uh, and we expect to see continuing uh, revenue losses. So it is a real issue and it does need to be addressed, but taxing, increasing taxes on EVs will not uh, solve the problem. It is not contributing to the problem. It's not expected to near term and it will not solve the, the problem. Uh, House file 523 uh, in that light only applies to electric vehicles. Uh, and does not apply to other vehicles, thus does, does little to address the real issue, which is declining uh, revenue from uh, improving fuel efficiency of, of conventional vehicles. For that, so that is an issue area that gives uh, concern for Drive Electric Minnesota. Um, I'll also just note that you know, Drive Electric Minnesota is, is supportive of finding solutions, is supportive of EVs paying our fair share, but we also want to see consistency in how electric vehicles are treated uh, in a gas tax. And, and uh, Representative Elkins, you kind of pointed this out. Um, if you drive a more fuel efficient vehicle, you pay less. If you drive miles, you pay less. So this uh, pilot pr program addresses one of those issues. It, it does allow for variation based on the miles driven, similar to a gas tax but it does not vary based on the actual fuel efficiency of the vehicle. Um, and so in that way, it is not consistent with the gas tax and, and singles out EVs and treats them differently. Um, I, I do wanna remind the committee and all, and Mr. Chair, I'll wrap up here just, just a, very shortly, but I, I do wanna remind the committee that, um, you know, fuel taxes are roughly one third of highway funding. Uh, EVs today pay more in terms of registration tax and motor vehicle sales tax. They also do today pay a $75 fee in lieu of gas tax. Uh, according to Drive Electric Minnesota's analysis, EVs today are over their lifetime paying an equivalent or higher amount than similar in class vehicles. Um, you know, in closing, uh, EVs are brand new technology. They're an emerging, emerging technology. They, I think they offer a lot of benefits for Minnesota. Uh, Drive Electric Minnesota feels that Minnesota should be supporting deployment of new technology and not adding additional tax and administrative burdens. We do reiterate our interest in being part of the conversation about assuring EVs pay their fair share and uh, that uh, other vehicles in addition to EVs are also paying their fair share uh, to result in a 
you know, sustainable revenue source for, for uh, highway maintenance in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, again, Representative Elkins, for the great discussion. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Our last testifier is Patrick Hines uh, for the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Mr. Hines, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Patrick Hines with Messerly Kramer. I'm testifying on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, which represents the automakers producing nearly 99% of cars and light trucks sold in the United States. Um, like many states, Minnesota must confront the fiscal challenges of adequately funding an aging transportation system while simultaneously adopting policies that address the increasing electrification of the automotive fleet. The challenge, of course, is how to balance these needs. Auto Innovators has worked with legislators across the country who have grappled with this issue, and our message is always the same. Don't discourage the growth of electric vehicles by imposing fees and raising barriers to purchase. And it seems likely that House File 523 would raise the fees for EVs and act as such disincentive. Studies consistently conclude that consumer acceptance of EV technology is critically important. They cite price as a barrier to adoption of the technology and note the need for additional incentives. Unfortunately, Minnesota lacks far behind other states in terms of purchase incentives and the build out of EV infrastructure while simultaneously placing mandates on automakers to deliver a far higher percentage of EVs to the state than are currently purchased here. Minnesota still trails the national average for EV sales, likely due to its lack of consumer incentives, and additional fees or burdens will only make matters worse. The most concerning, however, is that the bill seeks to impose yet another mandate on automakers by requiring them to report the mileage driven of Minnesota residents to third-party account providers. No other state requires automakers to do this, and we are opposed to that provision. Automakers recognize their role as trusted stewards of vehicle data, and in 2014, Auto Innovator members released a set of privacy principles that established a baseline of privacy protections related to the collection and use of such data. Most relevant to today's discussion, the principles require automakers to obtain affirmative consent before sharing information with unaffiliated third parties, and the account provider that would be created under the bill is such an unaffiliated third party. While we recognize the state's interest in securing transportation funding, Minnesota should not add another mandate on automakers, particularly when it could negatively impact consumer privacy and act as a disincentive to consumers considering purchase of their first electric vehicle. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to testify and uh, thank Representative Elkins for working with us. And of course, I'm willing to work with him and other stakeholders as you continue discussion on the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hines. And now members, let's go to uh, questions of any of the testifiers or the author, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. And I'm not gonna ask questions of anybody uh, be, to keep us on time. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. First of all, for Drive Electric uh, Minnesota and others, uh, just we have to remind ourselves that the sales tax and so forth for electric vehicles um, is comparable or, or less actually than some of our more high priced vehicles, et cetera, that'll pay the same uh, interest and tab fees um, moving forward as well. The $75 uh, just barely covers the gas tax. The other thing to remind ourselves of is the gas tax is not there to reduce carbon intake as much as it is for replacement of roads and bridges and wear and tear. And whether you have an electric vehicle or not, uh, or a regular one, that's, that's where it's at. My, co my just comment in regards to hearing about why we need a GPS was so that we don't charge people for electricity when they're used out of state. And I would just comment, I don't know why we would do that. Now, when you fill up your car at the border, for example, Representative Olson lives right on the Iowa border and he drives down to Iowa, he's not getting that tax back. He's paying the gas tax for all of his miles that he drives there as well. I don't know why we wouldn't do that uh, for um, electrical as well, as well as still the issue comes uh, when we deal with wholesale price, cars that drive through the state, if they fill up here, uh, they're gonna charge, be charged for that as well. And we should probably think about that as well. Uh, that's just comments for future thought, Mr. Chair. Uh, we don't need any uh, answers to it. Thank you. I appreciate that, Representative Petersburg. 
Um, we, I see no further member questions. Rep Representative Eccles, if you could keep your yeah. um, concluding comments brief, we might be able to get your final bill, your next bill in for the uh, before 2.30. Otherwise, we would move that into the evening. So, Representative yeah, Elkins, just, final words. Thank you, Madam, Mr. Chair. We're, we're laying this over, but I just, today's hearing, what I wanted to establish is that uh, I've got a mechanism that is practical. You, you heard from uh, MnDOT and DBS that this is something that they can, in fact, implement. Uh, we can continue the discussion on what the, uh, the rate should be, how the rate should be phased in. That would be entirely appropriate. Um, but it, the key point is, I think we should be doing this sooner rather than later because it will be much cheaper to implement when we've got, right, well, last year at this time we had 10,000 EVs. Now we have 15,000 EVs. A year from now, we'll have 25,000 EVs. Implementation of this is going to be much simpler uh, and, and, uh, and less expensive if we do it at low, low volume so that we have everything in place by the time we get up to, to, to scale. So let's, uh, I'll leave it, uh, leave it with that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Elkins. And as you mentioned, uh, House File 523, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the Transportation Bill. Members, I am going to need to um, uh, hand over our virtual gavel to Vice Chair Cagle for our last bill for this section. Uh, before I leave, I have word that there uh, will likely be a recess in the middle of the House uh, floor session, so we may be adjusting our schedule accordingly. So please uh, look at your emails. And uh, right now we're going to, uh, after this bill, recess until an hour after um, session, but uh, uh, that is flexible. So please stay in close contact with your LAs and your emails. Uh, Vice Chair Cagle, uh, please take over for our last bill of the day. Thank you, members. Sounds good, Mr. Chair. So, um, Representative Elkins, it looks like you have House File 3853. Would you like to move your bill? Um, yes, Madam Chair. I'll move. move uh, let's see. I think we're, this is. I think we're going to lay this one over as, as well. So, we'll be introducing House File 3833, and uh, this is a bill on behalf of the uh, auto dealers. And uh, Amber Bacchus from uh, Minnesota Auto Dealers Association will be presenting this bill. And it looks like you have a A1 amendment. Oh, yes. And the uh, purpose of this A1 uh, author's amendment is simply to align the, the bill with the, uh, the Senate language uh, so that when we get to conference, the bills will be, uh, be perfectly aligned. Would you move that amendment for me, please? I will move that amendment, yes. All right, members, this will be a voice vote. Is there any discussion to the A1 amendment? Seeing none, if you could all unmute, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. motion prevails. All right, Representative Elkins, please explain your bill. Um, yes, Ms. Uh, Bacchus is going to uh, present the bill. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Bacchus. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus. I'm Vice President of Public Affairs with the Minnesota Auto Dealers Association, here representing our 375 franchise new car and truck dealers located in communities around the state. And we are very grateful to Representative Elkins for bringing this bill forward. Um, as you can see in the language before you, Minnesota statute allows dealers to charge a documentary fee to recoup their costs associated with preparing, handling, and processing paperwork on behalf of a customer who is buying or leasing a vehicle. This covers both commercial transactions for the customer, such as paying off a loan on a trade-in on their behalf, and government-mandated functions like processing the vehicle title and registration. With the advent of MinDrive, the bulk of the work for entering and pulling together the title and registration has shifted to the dealer and occurs earlier in the sales process. This has increased the workload of dealership personnel and cost to dealerships, leading many of our members and their employees to raise concerns that the statutory cap on the dock fee isn't covering their costs. To verify whether their concerns were valid, our association decided to follow the Rick King model endorsed by this committee, and we hired a consulting firm, CLA, to provide an independent evaluation, including time and motion studies to determine dealership costs of handling customer paperwork. CLA also evaluated the results of an electronic survey of our membership and did a comparison of what other states allow, and the findings are as follows. 
The results of the time and motion studies and member survey were closely aligned. On average, dealerships spend four hours handling paperwork associated with the sales transaction at a cost of $324 to $409. As far as how our current doc fee aligns with that of other states, we are in the minority. 31 states do not regulate the amount of the fee, and of the other 18 that do, we are the second lowest after California. The bill before you raises the statutory cap to $350 over three years, which will allow dealers the ability to recover their costs and be made whole while continuing to provide consumer protection through your oversight of the fee. And with the amendment that was just adopted by the committee, lower value vehicles will never be charged more than 10% of the value of the vehicle um, for that, uh, for processing the paperwork on the customer's behalf. Um, so with that, I'll conclude my remarks and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, Representative Elkins, is there any other testifiers on this bill? There are not. All right, Member, members, any questions? All right, oh, Representative Kosnick. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Can we talk a little bit about the, the amendment and how that works and why that came about? Not lower cost vehicles are not getting charged more than 10% of the cost. And how is our lower cost vehicle defined? Uh, it looks like Ms. Backus has a, um, unmuted. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Kosnick. Um, this idea actually came um, from Chair Newman over in the Senate. Uh, he was concerned that uh, somebody purchasing a vehicle for $2,000 would be paying, you know, as much as $350 for the dock fee. Um, and so um, at his suggestion, uh, we incorporated this language to ensure that um, a customer would never be paying more than 10% the value of the vehicle in terms of the, the dock fee. Representative Kosnick. Thank you. I appreciate that explanation. Um, I guess I would just say if the premise is that there's a time and motion study and there's equal amount of work required, whether I don't think the paperwork differentiates whether it's a $2,000 vehicle or a $60,000 vehicle or a $20,000 vehicle. If, if the argument is, is that you need dealers need this money because they're losing money um, doing the paperwork, uh, I think it's kind of a mute point and I'm not sure that it uh, holds up to your argument of needing the additional document fee, but thank you for the explanation. Representative Kosnick, Representative Olson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess my question would be, the auto dealers, they, they have to make money, otherwise an auto dealership would not actually be performing its job of dealing with autos, uh, automotive vehicles. So is this increase in a fee just allowing the automotive dealer to tack it on by saying this vehicle costs $39,000, plus taxes and title fees, is that, are we hiding 350 extra dollars worth of fees by being able to encompass it in a, in a included plus the tax title and licensing fees? Wouldn't a dealership, if they're losing money on this end, wouldn't they just have to raise their rates on the actual cost instead of making it 39,000? It's now $39,350. That would be my question to Ms. Backus. Thank you. Ms. Beckus? Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Olson. That, that's a great question. Um, it's a, a, This uh, whole issue of the documentary fee is kind of unique in our industry. Um, it's something that's been around, I think, since the 80s. Um, for some reason, um, F&I sort of operations and the costs associated with that and F&I standing for finance insurance were sort of carved out separate from the price of the vehicle um, in terms of how sort of the, um, the whole, the marketing works. Um, so it has been separate um, in terms of how other states approach this as well, in terms of looking at what the costs are processing those transactions for customers and having it um, not included there um, in the margin or the price of the vehicle. But that being said, this fee has to be clearly articulated on um, the purchase agreement as a separate line item. Um, so it's not hidden from the consumer. Um, I also just want to add again, this is a, a statutory cap in statutes, a statutory maximum. 
Um, not all dealers charge the maximum. In our survey, we discovered that there are many who don't who use that as a competitive marketing tool or their communities, um, you know, their, their costs aren't as high in communities in greater Minnesota. Um, so they don't necessarily need to charge the full amount um, to compensate their employees. Representative Olson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Backus. I appreciate the answer. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions, Representative Elkins, would you like to renew your motion? Um, yes, uh, Madam Chair, we're just laying this over, so that's at the discretion of the chair. Yep, so I will move that um, House File 3833 be laid over as amended. And members, um, we are in recess. Um, so just keep an eye out on your email in your emails for um, for the for Mr. Howe's emails coming through for timing. Um, and I'm sure he'll let us all know when we need to be back. So we are in recess. <laughs>